Morning, everybody. So lovely to be here. It really is. Do do any of you uh, remember? Thanks, David. Do any of you remember the last time I spoke just a few weeks ago on uh, the first few chapters of first few verses of Hebrews twelve? Do you remember that the enemy did his best to disrupt and to stop the word of God going forth? I do. Somehow the PowerPoint slides of all the scripture readings disappeared from that little hard drive that I use. And I knew it was all okay that morning before I came. But when we came to load it onto the computer here, those scriptures, they were just not there. The slides from the previous message were still there, but not the one from the one that I was bringing that, that week. It's interesting, when I got home, I plugged that into my computer and they were, it was still not there. They'd completely disappeared off that hard drive. And then as I spoke, the sound system did its very best to make sure no one, no one was asleep. Interrupted a few times, <laughs> proved very difficult to get back on track again. It was a memorable morning, wasn't it? I hope you remember more than that. I hope you remember something from the message. <laughs> Ouch. It seems that Satan just did not want the word of God taught that day. But we, we prevailed. Despite the difficulties, Satan did not succeed. The Lord was glorified. Today I brought a spare hard drive stick with scripture slides on it, just in case. <laughs> Today we've really pressed in even more in prayer. We've affirmed that God is greater than anything the enemy may throw, throw at us. So, Father, as we open up your word today, Father, please speak to our hearts. Take these words you've given me and take them to each and every heart. Father, those here, those listening online, and Lord, just cement them into our spirits that, Father, they become part of us. For your, Lord, your word, Lord, is supernatural. And Father, it does miracles in us. So Lord, let that be for us this day in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So today I want to follow on from where I left off last time. I'm speaking from the letter of Hebrews and I'm focusing on the last verses, 14 to 29. And I've given this title, this message, as you can see the title, A Kingdom That Cannot Be Shaken. That's the kingdom that we are in, friends, right now. No matter what Satan may try, he will not succeed in pulling us down. He will not shake us, okay? He will not shake us. So we're going to read through those verses from 14 to 29 in entirety just to get the context of it before we break it into sections. So we start with verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his, inher his, his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. Because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. 
If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook, shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's begin at verses 14 to 17. We'll open them up a little bit. We'll try to reveal some of the thoughts behind them. So the first one is verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Isn't it far better to live at peace with our fellow man than to be living in a state of friction with them? There's often stories on TV about neighbours having a dispute about something, often it's over something quite silly, but they'd rather argue and quarrel and compromise and try to live at peace with each other. I cannot understand those attitudes. I really can't. The spirits of anger and selfishness seem to be on the increase in the world, friends. So let's be on our guard that we don't fall into the ways of the world in that area. All of us. You know, I don't know about you, but I certainly prefer a peaceful life over one of conflict. Paul, in his letter to the people of Rome, said this in Romans 12. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. That verse 19 tells us that we are to leave any retribution against someone who has wronged us to the Lord, because he will repay in due course. Going back to Hebrews, we're told that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. There are quite a few references to God's call for us to be holy in the Old Testament, and it's particularly in Leviticus. And it's a requirement for us under the New Covenant also. Peter picks this up in his first letter. Verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. If we really want to be holy, that is, set apart for the Lord, then our witness must agree with those words of Scripture. Must agree. Holiness, holiness, it's not a works thing. It grows out of our relationship with God. The better that relationship, the greater will be our holiness. There's no future in holding grudges or unforgiveness toward anyone. <clears throat> Verse 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. These two opening verses that we're looking at, they follow on from the previous teaching that spoke about accepting the discipline of the Lord and enduring or persevering in trials that are sent to strengthen us as we go through them. Those who cannot endure, those who reject the Lord's discipline, can become bitter, sometimes a little prickly, can't they? They feel hard done by. They withdraw from those around them. They begin to shut down. I think that most of us would know people who have felt offended by something or someone in a church or even in the world. And instead of dealing with it properly, they've let a spirit of bitterness take root. Instead of dealing with their perceived wrongs, they leave and go to another church or they just carry on out in the world as though nothing's happened. They take the hurts with them and slowly that bitterness creeps in. God must have known that bitterness would be a problem in human beings right from very, very early on. Way back in Deuteronomy when Moses was giving the law, God gave a warning through him. Deuteronomy 29, 18. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today, whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such a bitter poison. Those who turned away from God, those who followed their own desires, 
those who decided it was too hard to stay the distance, those who did not have the endurance or perseverance to follow after God, they let a root of bitterness spring up. Instead of living as God wanted them to, they wandered off after their own desires. And God describes bitterness as poison. The poison of bitterness works through the whole person, changes them from the inside out. They become different people, blinded to the things of God. But God can change it if we let him. If we let him. I'm sure we have seen many who have a have a bitterness in them. And I'm equally sure that we've all seen that God can bring change in those lives. Question, has anybody heard here heard of a lady named Charlotte Eddian, Elliot? Charlotte Elliot? Okay. She lived in Brighton in England in the early 1800s. I came across a little story that well illustrates the power of God to change a life. She was full of hate and anger, had become sour, bitter and resentful. And one day she released a load of vitriol against a Swiss minister who told her she was like she was because she had nothing else in the world to cling to. They talked on and as they talked, Charlotte asked, what's the cure? The minister told her, just give yourself to God, just as you are now, with your fightings and fears, hates and loves, your pride and shame. She did come just as she was and her heart was changed that day. She claimed at John 6.37 for herself, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Sometime later, her brother, a Reverend Henry Elliot, was raising funds for a school for the children of poor clergymen. Charlotte wrote a poem and it was printed. It was sold right across England. The leaflet said, Sold for the benefit of St Margaret's Hall, Brighton. Him that cometh to me I will need no wise cast out. And underneath was, was Charlotte's poem. It has become the most famous invitational hymn in history. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, just as I am. And Alana, I sure thought of that when you were talking about the music over the years. That was early 1800s, and it's still sung today. Still has so much meaning, very precious. A bitter root comes when we allow disappointment to grow into resentment, or when we nurse grudges over past hurts. Bitterness brings with it jealousy, dissension, sometimes even immorality. Never doubt that if we take our hurts and angers and bitterness to him, he can change us. He can. So let's read on, read on in verses 16 and 17. See that no one is sexually immoral, or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the eldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. So the writer gives Esau as an example to us. You probably remember Esau. He sold his, his inheritance for a pot of stew. He put his own physical desires ahead of his birthright. We're told he was sexually immoral. There's no direct evidence in the Genesis account, but there is a hint of that in Genesis 28. The main point is that Esau was selfish. Was the main point is that Esau was selfish and just wanted his own way instead of wanting to follow the ways laid out by God. As he got older, he began to realize the errors of his ways. He would have given anything to regain his inheritance. He just could not undo the past. It's a picture of many lives today where wrong choices in early years lead to much hardship in later years. There's only one way to deal with that situation. While Esau desired to turn his life around in later years, we're told he was rejected. God looks at the heart. It seems to me that God looked at his heart and decided that no, Esau's not there yet. He's still not in a place to really give his life over to, to God. I'm sure God would have forgiven him and restored him if he was truly repentant for his past. Remember Peter, who through fear of man denied the Lord Jesus three times? 
When Jesus met with him by the sea of Tiberias, he was, he was repentant from the heart and he was forgiven. He was reinstated. He eventually went on to become one of the most powerful of the apostles. The same applies to us today, friends. We can do all things we don't, we can all do things we don't want to do. We can all make mistakes. We're all susceptible to failure. But, but we are told God is faithful to his word. If we repent, if we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive and he will lift us up to our rightful place with him. He will. The verses that follow shift the emphasis from the Old Testament law and the failure of Esau to be able to partake of God's forgiveness. To our, they shift to our standing in grace. You know, I love these few verses because out of the story in Genesis, God brought them to life in me one day and somewhere down the track I'll probably share what transpired. It's not a message for today. But the writer of Hebrews now turns his thoughts to Deuteronomy and in particular to the giving of the law. If we go to verse 18 of chapter 12. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling of fear. And to set the scene, we need to look back at a few verses in Exodus 19, 16 to 19. The people had come out of Egypt, they'd crossed the Red Sea, and now God meets with them and this is where he gives them the law. But Exodus 19, verse 16 on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. <coughs> Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke. And the voice of God answered him. I wonder, can you picture that scene? It must have been something awe-inspiring. The mountain's covered in the presence of God. There's an earthquake, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's a piercing sound of a trumpet. The people had been warned not to touch it. They were to stay at a distance. Even though they had experienced the presence of God in the cloud by day and the fire by night... This was a whole new experience. It suddenly awakened the fear of God in them. Suddenly they had a taste of a holy God who was far above their own beings. This is the thought that the writer of Hebrews is bringing to the people and to us. He's reminding us of the awe of God. That under the law they fell far short of being able to touch God. He was on the mountain. They were at the base of the mountain. They were forbidden to even touch it. They were filled with the natural fear of being struck dead if they touched it. And as well as that, suddenly God was far more real than before. They now knew God as a God of judgment and they were afraid. Even Moses was trembling with fear. Yet he was a man, yet he was a man who was ever so close to God. Truly, it must have been an awe inspiring sight. It really must. So the writer of Hebrews reminds us of what, what it was like once when God revealed himself to his people. Now, he says, we've not come to such a place. We have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. We do not come in dread of losing our very lives if we want to touch God. Let's just, just look again at those words to cement them in our spirits. Verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, <clears throat> to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. Those people, well, they, they'd have been, 
almost rigid with fear. But friends, we have not come to that mountain. From that mountain, God gave the law which man was unable to keep. Praise God for his mercy that he set us free from the demands of the law. He's given us a whole different relationship with God. Look at the next verses. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a a better word than the blood of Abel. Beautiful words. From speaking about the physical Mount Zion, he switches to the spiritual Mount Zion. Remember in the opening verses of this chapter, last last time I spoke, we were reminded about the vast crowd of witnesses cheering us on. Remember that? Now we're told we've come to thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly. All of the angels, they're glad to see us. Wow. The gospel message is encapsulated in these couple of verses. We're joined into the church of the firstborn, Jesus Christ. The word church is the word ecclesia, the called out ones, a Christian community of believers on earth. We're set apart from the ones who have not yet called on Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Set apart, called out to be his people on this earth until such time as we leave these mortal tents and go to be with him for eternity in heaven. From a picture of the awe of God on the mountain, we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. This is a covenant that is far, far superior to the old covenant. The blood of Jesus washes us from all sin, so much so that even now, God sees us as perfect. Look at uh, chapter 10, verse 14. Because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By the sacrifice of Christ, he's made us perfect forever. Regardless of how we see ourselves, God sees us as perfect. That's mind-boggling. We're still being made holy. The perfection of our holiness is an ongoing process. But in God's eyes, we're already perfect because of the sacrifice of Jesus and the washing of his blood. It is that powerful. That's really a wonderful place to be. It really is a wonderful place to be. So let's move on to the next verse. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? If we go back through Old Testament history, we see that when the people backslid, they turned away from following God, they were warned time after time to warn them, to uh, mend their ways. And just like now, God doesn't want any of us to be lost. He did not want any of his people lost back then. When they started going their own way, God was very patient with them until it got to the point where he had to jolt them into a renewed awareness of him. They did not escape the judgment of God and now the writer of Hebrews warns us from the lessons of history. God sent his only son as an atoning death so that we may be saved. Because of the great cost of our salvation, we can expect far greater punishment than the people under the old covenant. God's word is full of warnings to us and we must obey him. We must not turn away from him who warns us from heaven. We must not. The writer tells us that his voice once shook the earth. Verse 26, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Remember the earthquake and the thunder and the lightning and the voice of God and the trumpet blast when they were assembled at Mount Zion? His voice shook the earth. Here we're told that the earth will be shaken again and this time the heavens also. God gave a warning through the prophet Haggai that points to this happening and we need to look at that. Haggai 2 verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations 
and the desire of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. So nothing is going to be left out. Everything will be shaken. We just need to look at the book of Revelation. We can see the outworking of this. It all ties together. We're told that created things will be shaken, but what cannot be shaken will remain. What cannot be shaken? Only God himself and the kingdom of heaven itself. If we look at the next verse, we see this. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Friends, this is the climax to the whole chapter. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. How wonderful is that? How wonderful it is. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word endures forever, says the Lord. Nothing can ever shake God's kingdom. Nothing can ever shake God's kingdom. As we watch this tired, fractured old world and its systems lurch from one calamity to the next, let's remember where we belong in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Keep our eyes off this worldly system and the way it's going. Look to where we really belong. There's no better place to be, friends. The more we can grasp the import of these words, the greater should be our thankfulness. The more we can grasp the import of what God has so fully done, the greater should be our gratitude and our thankfulness. We're told to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. I was reminded of Isaiah when he had a vision of God in the temple. He felt undone before the majesty of God. He suddenly saw his sinfulness against the purity of God. He was immediately repentant. Friends, I don't believe we're any different to Isaiah. If suddenly God revealed himself to us right now in a vision that we could all see, I'm sure each and every one of us would be flat on our faces on that carpet. Just like Isaiah, there could only be one response, one of absolute reverence and awe. Friends, thank God for the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us and made us righteous in his sight. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that allows us to be called his kids and to be counted as his family. That's where we belong. That last verse, verse 29, it's a sobering reminder of the fate that would await us if we ever turned away from him who warns us from heaven. It brings a challenge to us to never let go of God and turn our backs on him. It brings a challenge to us to walk in holiness with God at all times. It brings a challenge to us to never let any bitterness creep into our lives and when we feel slighted by anyone to deal with it in the Lord. It brings a challenge to us to live peaceably with others at all times. It brings us back to the challenge of verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Joe read something right at the very beginning of the service before she led us into worship. And as she read it, I thought, how, my, how well the theme of those words fitted with the theme of this message. And I'm going to ask Joe to repeat that now, to read it out again to all of us. Let's listen to it. I haven't ever seen what I'm currently seeing all over the world as I travel and minister. There's a hunger and a fervour for God that is authentic and desperate. People are longing for presence, not platform. Encounter, not hype. Worship, not performance. Transformation, not behaviour modification. Power, not points. Both spirit and truth. Both faith and works. It's happening amongst the young and the old. Men and women in tents and arenas. The shaking, reckoning and purifying has been God preparing us for what he's prepared us for. 
These are days to draw near and not draw back, to press in and not tap out, to endure and not yield, to stay focused and not be distracted. The reward will, be far, will far exceed the price paid. I think we might just be on the edge of something we've never seen or known before. I hope that we are. I hope that we are on the edge of something really, really special. How we need it. How this world needs it. How we need it. Oh, Lord. Oh, we need you. Those who do not know Jesus as Lord and Saviour await that dreadful meeting with God when the time comes to leave this earth. Thank God that he draws us into an ever-increasing relationship with himself that we can expect a far greater welcome. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Father, for what we can look forward to. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've told us, all that you've taught us and all that you are teaching us. And Father, as you draw us ever closer to you, Father, let our hearts be open to receive all of you, everything of you, just to receive, Lord, just you. Nothing of the world but just you, Lord. And Father, where there's ways that our lives, Father, just... Um, Take hold of those things of the world, maybe, in different areas, Father. Forgive us for that. Teach us, Lord, that, Lord, you've got everything. The world, has got, the world can offer us nothing. But in you, we have everything. We really do. So, Lord, please, take these words that you've given us today. Draw us on with you. Cause us, Father, to seek your face more and more and more. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. That is a challenging word, isn't it? That's a word we must respond to and not just let it go over our heads, but let it sink in to our hearts. I'm truly touched by that word and it's a word that is in good season, I think. I'm going to invite anybody who wants prayer because I want it today. Uh, because as we step forward into that which God has for us as a group, there are plans and purposes that God has for us as individuals as well. And as I've experienced what I've experienced this week, there's this anticipation of what God has next. So I was um, just looking at a few verses out of Ephesians as we finish. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to com comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let us walk into this week in that power, in the knowledge and love of Jesus, and be open to his transforming power within our own lives. Bless you. And if you uh, would like prayer,
today. Uh, please, I'm again to ask uh, Col and Jenny to pray for me and any others. Um, and if you need prayer, please ask those around you or those whom you, tr you like to pray for you today. God bless you.